welcome to To Grow Good, a podcast of conversion stories, to share encounters with the living God, to bear good fruit, a place where others can meet or be inspired to meet God. So get cozy, lean in, and listen close. Miracles are at work, and He wants to meet you too. My name is Rachel Smith, and I'm your host. Now let's start growing some good. Hi, friend, and welcome to another episode of To Grow Good. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I hope that you've just had a fruitful, amazing, beautiful week filled with God's grace. I hope you've been enjoying the warmer weather, at least where I am. It's getting warmer and the days are getting longer, which makes me so much happier. (laughs) So hopefully you've been enjoying that wherever you are as well. I am so excited tonight to um, be welcoming our guest onto the show. Emily Crankfield is from Denver, Colorado, and is a 2019 graduate of Benedictine College, where she studied theology, evangelization, catechesis, and poli-sci. She spent her first post-grad year as a missionary with the Culture Project, which does amazing work where she spoke to students about the dignity of human life and the richness that comes from living a life of sexual integrity. She loves ministry, especially in the realm of theology of the body and fostering healthy relationships with a special place in her heart for encouraging young women. If you don't already follow Emily on Instagram, you should go on over and check her out. She's at emily.marie.crankfield, and uh, she does a lot of awesome work just sharing the faith and sharing her, a little bit about her life and how she lives that out, and also sharing these truths about who we are as human, our dignity, and the beauty of the riches of theology of the body. So I can't wait to hear how Emily first came to know the Lord. Um, I first stumbled upon Emily, I know, from my own journey when I started digging more into theology of the body. Um, And it was answering so many deep questions for me about who I was, what it meant to be a woman in this crazy world that sometimes tells you so many different things about what it means. Um, And yeah, I just related to her in so many ways and she was able to speak the truth to me in a beautiful way. So I can't wait and I, uh, I just can't wait to hear how it was that she was first introduced to that, that truth and that beauty. Thank you so much if you're joining us live. I wanted to let you know that you can at any time say anything at all in the chat. You can ask a question throughout Emily's story. And at the end, we will take questions during the Q&A and answer them as best as we can and, and have a fun chat. So, all right, without any other delay, let's welcome Emily onto the show. Hi, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Hi, Emily. We are so happy to have you here with us tonight. Could you just start us out by, I know I just read a little bit about you, but could you just introduce yourself for the audience and share Mm -hmm. a little bit about what it is that you do now? Of course. So um, like you said, I am originally from Denver, Colorado, grew up here and um, went to Catholic school my whole life. I grew up in a cradle Catholic family, went going to Catholic school, and it was always something that was a big part of my life. Um, something, a, a part of my story is just always being really involved in my faith and really involved in different things, but also feeling like I was living a double life, um, especially when it comes to chastity and different things like that, um, falling into my own kind of struggle in that realm, which we can, I'm sure we'll dive into a little more, but um, feeling like I was the youth group girl, but then also was living this other life as well. And so struggling with that in certain regards. Um, But it kind of continued as I went into college, um, went to Benedictine College, where truly my faith just came alive in a lot of ways. And the Lord really pursued me there. And um, after Benedictine, like you said, went to the Culture Project because you know somebody once said to me, your best, give me your misery and I'll show you your ministry, right? 
give me your mi- misery and I'll show you your ministry. Something that I've been carrying for a long time and I wanted to give back after the Lord had kind of guided me out of that time of life and um, became a missionary at the Culture Project. Had an awesome year giving talks to middle schoolers and high schoolers. And then, um, then I just kind of felt like I needed to switch things up. I ended up moving back to my college town and I worked for Sarah Swafford. She's like um, a Steubenville speaker. Yeah. And she does a lot of different things in the realm of relationships. Um, so I worked for her for a year, which was really great. Um, and during that year I met my now husband and it was a really beautiful year of really growing together and relationship and discerning how the Lord wanted us to grow in that relationship and needed to, um, in the next steps of engagement and everything like that, to come back to Denver, the Denver area where I'm from. I got a job at the Archdiocese of Denver. So I currently work at the Archdiocese of Denver and I serve as a youth ministry specialist, which is really fun. (laughs) And basically just running all the larger scale events that the Archdiocese puts on for our youth groups. So um, larger conferences, retreats, um, programs that we have for our youth groups to use. So kind of like an event planner, but in ministry, which is really fun. So it's my dream job, really bringing all that together. Um, and then we just got married um, two months ago, about now. So March 19th, Nathan and I got married, which is really excited, exciting. And we're just settling into married life, trying to figure all that out and um, just adjust to this beautiful time in our, our new vocation. So that's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Married. And yeah, I love that you just gave us like this nice outline of yeah. your story <laughs> at a really high level, but that's amazing. Just like, mm-hmm. I love that um, like your deepest wound or your hardest area could become your ministry because that's like where mm-hmm. the Lord so often does the most beautiful work in us and then calls us to help others that Mm -hmm. struggle in that same area. And that's one of the things I love about people's conversion stories because you really Mm -hmm. can see that um, in their background and their upbringing and the things that they struggled with. It's usually that that draws them back into the church, which is so ironic and strange in some ways, but it also makes sense because I think like you said, it's like our biggest wound becomes like our greatest glory when mm-hmm. we give it to God, you know, right. when he's able to, yeah, bring glory from from the ways that we have fallen um, mm-hmm. and, then do, and then actually help others, you know, in that mm-hmm. same area. So I think that's that's so beautiful. Um, but yeah, let's let's maybe go back to the beginning, like you said. Mm-hmm. So you grew up in a Catholic family. Mm -hmm. Um, but do you want to just share maybe a little bit about like what God was like for you growing up and what religion Mm -hmm. really meant to you? Um, and then if you can remember a moment or a time where you realized maybe there was more to this than just what people had told you it was and you actually Mm -hmm. understood that he was there. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. This has been something that I've been um, kind of reflecting on just in getting married and, you know, praying about starting a family and everything like that, of just looking at my family of origin and the whole story of, of how that began and everything. And um, yeah, my parents were both Catholic, grew up Catholic. And I think it was one of those things where, you know, you just went to church, you know, you never missed on Sundays, but then you prayed before meals, but you went to church and it was great if you could send your kids to Catholic school um, because I, I think they both went to Catholic school. And so that was something that they had always wanted as well. And so that was kind of the basis of it, but I don't really remember there being much more, um, especially growing up and especially when we were really young, but something that I've been really reflecting on and, um, I'm still meaning to ask my mom about is I just remember there was a shift at one point. And I know that a lot of times that happened or the shift in all of our hearts kind of started with, I think my mom's conversion. Um, and she, from the little bit that I do know is she just kind of really came to know the Lord deeper in a deeper way by going to Eucharistic adoration. Um, Mm -hmm. our parish has had, uh, 24 seven Eucharistic adoration for as long as I've known. And so I really think that she just kind of signed up on a whim because that was what they were encouraging everybody to do. And it just really deepened her faith life. And so, I remember there being a a shift. I remember there being a a deep shift um, and still like trying to pinpoint, but 
I think it was in middle school probably when I really started being opened up to the faith a little more. Um, I had an awesome theology teacher in seventh and eighth grade who was a really cool young woman and she she had been a focused missionary, just very lively, beautiful. And I just remember seeing her and wanting to be just like her. I thought she was so great. Um, and so I kind of just started diving into it a little bit then. Um, and then always, I always seemed to have the opportunities to participate more. I don't know. I was asked to be one of the eighth grade sacristans for masses. And yeah, I just kind of like those opportunities kept coming to me, like the Lord was pursuing me through these different opportunities that were coming up. And it's only been in later years that I've seen how all of those have come together in creating who I am now today. But um, yeah, I think that that was probably the shift was in middle school. I remember we had our first talk um, from Jason Everett. We like it was a first chastity talk. He came and gave one to my school and one of the local schools as well. And that was probably my first experience of being opened up to theology of the body or chastity or talks like that. He was probably the first one there. And then really the big point for me was after I graduated from eighth grade and was going into high school, I went to, I started going to the Steubenville conferences. So those are the, the summer high school conferences that they have um, all across the country, but we have one here in Denver and um, those really opened my eyes to a lot of different things and a lot of the wounds that I had and trying to heal them. So I think it was through those larger events and especially that chastity aspect of it that I was realizing, um, yeah, there was a lot more to the faith, you know, and I wanted to learn more um, and share more with my family and have my family grow in it as well. So that'd probably be like the the initial stages for me there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love how, I mean, what are the odds that you would even be in the position to have Jason Everett coming to you and talking. I mean, that I is a grace in itself because at that age, you know, it's funny because mm -hmm. as you're telling your story, I'm thinking about my own naturally. And it was middle school really when I felt like I started to drift mm -hmm. because, and I think for a lot of people, that age is a really tough age. And it's kind of like, you know, your peers become much more interesting than like mm -hmm. what you're learning mm -hmm. at, at CCD class or um, these other things. And so, I, I mean, how pivotal to have these people that are, are on fire mm -hmm. and so full of joy, like you said in, in the witness of your, your teacher too, like just you can see that there's more to this mm -hmm. than just what maybe the head knowledge or what other people might be telling you. But when you see someone actually living it out, I love how you're kind of describing that it was those lights that really mm -hmm. attracted you. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I think there might be something more here than what I thought it was before. Um, Absolutely. So then what happened, I guess, from there, you know, did yeah. you, did you connect the dots that it was, you know, the sacraments and mm -hmm. this whole path to holiness, or was it kind of like you were learning this chastity stuff and realizing that maybe that was a place where you, you wanted to grow, mm -hmm. but you didn't, I mean, how do you even go about, especially at that age, yeah. how do you even go about beginning to even like tackle that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, before I dive into that, one of the things that I've just always been so grateful for is, um, like you said, the access to Jason Everett and different things. Something I'm very passionate about and now working at the Archdiocese of Denver, even more passionate about is just the beauty of the church here in Denver and the strength of the community here. Um, I think Jason at the time was living out here and was working out here. And so it was a lot of the schools, we had a lot more access to him. And so I've always been very grateful to the Lord for placing me specifically in this geographical location um, because we had so much access to different things growing up um, that, like you said, is such a gift. Now, at the same time, something that I've often reflected on is there were a lot of people that were also in that talk that I went to grade school with that have absolutely fallen away from the faith, you know, and that aren't still um, practicing the faith. And so that's a really interesting thing that an interesting dynamic that I often take to prayer of Lord, why did it hit me in a way that was different than these other people, you know, and why did it penetrate my heart and continue to live out in my, in my heart and to my life. And so again, something that I've always prayed with and continued with. And so, yeah, that goes into your next question of just connecting the dots. And, um, 
So a big part of my story, like I mentioned with chastity is, um, and I'm, I love talking about this because again, it's what I'm really passionate about and sharing and working with other women. Um, but from a young age, I was unfortunately exposed to pornography and that was something that came up at a very young age. And I, um, yeah, I was too young to realize what was going on and I was too young to know what it was. And by the time I realized it, you know, I was already struggling with an addiction and, um, that's something that, like I said, from those early years, it was just like such a, everything's changing, everything's going on. You know, I'm involved in my faith. I'm loving my theology class, my religion classes in eighth grade. Um, but I have this thing, you know, that, that I'm struggling with and I can't seem to, to work with, if that makes sense. And so going to those conferences, it was just always, um, I don't know, the best way I can describe high school and college in regards to my spiritual life of dealing with this other aspect was just a wrestling, like a constant wrestling and a three steps forward, one step back, you know, or back or vice versa, you know, three steps backwards, one step forward. And um, really just wrestling with that as I continued on. Um, it, like I said, would go to these conferences. And I remember sitting in some of them and hearing the talks and just wanting to find freedom from what I was struggling with and to be able to not feel like I was living a double life. Um, like I said, I was. And so, um, yeah, that was something that I definitely continued wrestling with as I went through um, middle school and and then especially in high school. But I think the big part for me in high school was, um, oh, there you go back. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm back. I lost you I for talking. a minute there. <laughs> the, fun, the joys of live streaming. Um, Amen to that. That's hilarious. Yes. Yeah. You dropped out right um, when you were talking about right after you said, unfortunately, that you had been exposed to pornography and then mm, okay. that you were like struggling between obviously what you were being exposed to and loving and then actually mm -hmm. having this thing going on in the mm -hmm. background in your life. And and then yeah. you were explaining how it, it, it was kind of like a three steps forward, one step back. Journey. Yeah, exactly. And so I was just kind of wrestling with it through all that time. And um, the common theme that kind of came up was just feeling this, like I was living a double life and nobody knew, um, you know, I was a woman that was struggling with it and that wasn't really talked about, especially at the time. Luckily now it's being talked about a little bit more. Um, but I thought I was the only person in the world that the only girl in the world that was struggling with that. And so that was a really heavy thing that I was carrying for a long time. Um, but I think as I kept continued moving, you know, praise the Lord that that struggle didn't just turn me off from the faith completely. Um, and kind of the, the um, helplessness that I felt didn't turn me off from the faith completely because I continued on and went to high school and I went to a Catholic high school that was kind of more nominally Catholic. Um, there were a lot of non-Catholics at the school. So um, I had to talk about the faith a lot and I had to defend the faith a lot. And I kind of started noticing that there was this kind of head conversion where I was being questioned on different aspects of the faith and different things we believe in. And so I needed to know the answers. And so it kind of provided this greater desire for me to um, dive deeper into the answers and trying to figure them out and trying to figure out what is going on um, and how to share the faith with others. And so that was kind of that next step in high school where things started coming together of, I know I need to defend the faith to people and share about the faith with others um, and trying to figure out how to as well. So. There's also one teacher in high school that really, again, made, I just wanted to be like him too. He was just amazing. And so it was cool how the Lord kept placing these teachers and these mentors in my life as I carried on. Um, but yeah, so again, high school wrestling, wrestling with what I know to be wrong, but then struggling with it. Um, but then also like in an intellectual way, trying to figure out how to share about the faith and how to defend the faith. Um, yeah, it's kind of, I'm, I'm like on a whole journey myself, just thinking about it now too, trying to bring all the pieces together um, because there was so much working at that time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, it's such a, there's at that age anyway, like there's so much going mm -hmm. on. And so then you add this stuff and it's, it's beautiful that you were exposed to the richness of mm -hmm. the truth and that you were able, I think something, I, I love how you're kind of describing this like battle because that's what mm -hmm. it is. I mean, that's what mm -hmm, it is absolutely. In, in each one of our hearts and our souls. Like there's a battle going on between 
what we know and what we we're drawn to that truth. We want to live it. We see it like maybe in others and we're attracted to it, but we don't really know how to get there. And even this, Mm -hmm. I mean, I can so relate to it even now. You know what I mean? Like I feel like it's something that we continually are journeying through throughout Mm -hmm. our lives, this battle. And really like even just the other day, I, I, I was like in prayer with the Lord and I felt like, I was just saying, you know, you, you power. Um, it requires the Lord and His grace to purify us through the mm-hmm. sacraments, through the Eucharist, especially. Like that is what's purifying us, um, mm-hmm. and time with Him, you know, in prayer mm-hmm. and Scripture and. It's like by doing that, then then we're actually made holier. And it, so often, I you know, I still come up against just like my sinfulness, you know? Mm-hmm. Like it's like we can only be as strong as like the Lord is able to make us at, yeah. at any stage of our journey. Um, it reminds me of uh, when St. Paul is – Like, right, it's like I do what I do not want to do. Like I know Mm -hmm. what I want to do, but yet I don't do it. And I can so relate to that struggle between like knowing and seeing and wanting this, but then like still doing this or feeling like we aren't quite, you know, there, but we can – we're almost like stretching out to try to – get there in ways, um, which I guess is the journey and the path to, to holiness. Um, but yeah, so then, so that was like in high school. Mm -hmm. Um, and also just, wow, what a hard time. I mean, the fact that you were exposed to that Mm -hmm. darkness and that evil at such a young age, Mm -hmm. um, but then to be working through all of this on top of everything else that high school brings, you know, it, Mm -hmm. it sounds like it was a, definitely a hard time in your mm-hmm. in your life and in your journey but yet the lord was so clearly at work with the people mm-hmm. he's putting in your path and what he's exposing you to it was like he had begun this work of mm-hmm. restoration but it was it was like in the midst of it when when you were in high school absolutely um, so it then was easy what to feel alone. yeah <laughs> sorry ahead. i shouldn't say it was easy to feel alone like i said like not knowing not having the confidence at the time to share with other people and not really understanding what was going on. It was a, it was a lonely time, but it was like you said, a blessed time definitely. And the Lord was working for sure. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. I would love to hear just like even looking back now, you know, mm-hmm. cause I'm sure when you're in it, it's kind of like, what is going on? You know, yeah, I'm feeling totally. really maybe lost and confused, but then mm-hmm. now maybe looking back, you're able to see maybe what was going on at a mm-hmm. greater scale, like what the Lord was was beginning to put the soil, you know, till the soil of yeah. that would come to fruition later. Um, but yeah, so then I guess what happened from there? So you were yeah. in high school mm-hmm. and – At this time too, like, were you practicing the faith? Like, were you praying? Did you have like Mm -hmm. your own prayer life or was it very like intellectually driven? Yeah. um, I would say coming to know the faith more was in a sense intellectually driven, but I was always still finding myself going to prayer and um, helping out at youth group. I really, I was a huge um, leader in our youth group, really trying to do all I could to be involved there. Um, and I think a really key component, like you said, of how the Lord blessed that time and looking back, um, blessed that time is he put really wonderful friendships into my life at that time. And, um, I even dated a really wonderful guy in high school who, when I was struggling with all this other stuff, um, that was never like chastity was never a struggle in our relationship, which was, um, such a gift, especially for somebody who was struggling on such a deep level. Um, and so I've been so grateful to the Lord for, that person um, in, in, in that part of my life in, in general, but also just my friendships. I had a few friendships that were, especially one best friend in particular who was equally on fire and who we used to call her a saint, right? We were like, oh, this is St. Haley, you know, and um, she 
she was really inspirational to me in just, um, you know, encouraging me to go to mass with her during our lunch hour. Because we were still at a Catholic school, so we had a lot of opportunities there. We had a chapel on campus and um, really trying to go the extra mile. And um, so I'm always grateful for the people that were in my life at that time as well, um, because, yes, the Lord definitely surrounded me with good people, because, like you said, and I really like that you use the word the battle and the wrestling that we had. Um, I think all too often when that battle comes, a lot of people turn away or don't know what to do. Um, but truly our faith, what our faith promises is suffering. And um, that is one core aspect of the Catholic faith is is taking up our cross and following the Lord. And so when we and when I at a young age learned to continue to take up my cross every day and to go back to confession and try to work through things and try to shine myself with the right people and different things, um, that was, again, to, you know, preparing the soil for what the Lord was going to do as I went into college Um and yeah, I, I do I do think I had a good prayer life. I, I think I think prayer was going to adoration with my friend or my boyfriend and like sitting there and praying a rosary and reading, you know. Um, but I'm grateful that I still was showing up, you know, that there was something to it. Um, but I but I can as as we continue going on and talking about college, I still remember like the moment where I felt like I prayed for the first time. And so, you know, there was a time of um, there was a time of obviously going to prayer, but maybe not what I would now call prayer, if that makes sense, you know, um, yeah, as totally I continue to my sense. journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I love, I love how you just explained that because it's so yeah. true. It's like we can, mm-hmm. I mean, it still is prayer. Like you're there with him and you're, mm-hmm. but it's like, it's just a level of intimacy. I feel like mm-hmm. in your prayer. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So do you want to explain just like what happened when you, when it was time to get ready to go to college? Did you seek a Catholic school specifically Mm -hmm. for, for that reason? Um, And then just, yeah, I guess what was your journey into eventually becoming a culture project (laughs) missionary? Absolutely. Yeah. So it got crazy after that. So freshman year got a little, or freshman year was just a really crazy transformational life or year of my life. Um, but kind of with everything, like I said, um, having these theology teachers that I loved in, in middle school and in high school, and then really getting involved in my youth group, that was when I decided I really wanted to study or become a youth minister was kind of what um, the Lord was, the path the Lord was kind of drawing me on in that regard. And so I, because I wanted to study youth ministry or theology, there's a, a smaller list of schools to kind of look at in regards to that, and especially the really strong ones here in, in the United States. And so um, I started looking at those and decided to go to Benedictine College. I decided between Benedictine and Franciscan. And um, Benedictine was just a little closer um, to Colorado. It's in Kansas. And I knew a lot of people that went there. And so it just, it honestly, in the end, it was a comfort decision. It was, uh, I'm just going to kind of stay in my comfort zone. Um, But I can't imagine who I would be if I hadn't gone there. Just, it was just, it's my favorite place in the world. I I love Benedictine and everything about it and my whole experience there, the people that I got to know there um, are just really wonderful. And so I decided to go to Benedictine and study theology and evangelization was our, was my majors. Um, Our evangelization program is the youth ministry program. So they actually have a degree in youth ministry, which is really awesome. So got to do that. And um, yeah, again, going into freshman year, um, living that Dublin life, but the new component of struggling and really um, feeling away from the Lord was going through a breakup with my high school boyfriend. And um, it just got really messy, which looking back, it didn't need to be. And, um, you know, it it just got really messy. And that's kind of when you go through your first breakup, I feel like sometimes that happens a lot. And um, I really, really struggled with it and didn't handle a lot of it really well. And so it was kind of a dark cloud over the whole freshman year, um, along with everything else. And um, yeah, I, there was a lot more to it. But I think in in the middle of that, I went to the uh, SEEK conference. Well, the they have other conferences like the SLS conference that the, that Focus puts on. Um, and they used to do them in between every SEEK conference. And so I went to the SLS conference and... Um, The best way I describe it is I went into the, a lot of times at those conferences, they'll have different areas with booths where people will, you know, set up and meet 
meet you and sometimes it's missionary organizations, sometimes it's shops, whatnot. Um, but I still remember walking down the hallway of the booth section and I saw this little blue table in the corner. And from the moment I walked in, I just felt so drawn to it. Um, but I had no idea what it was. And so I ignored it for two days. <laughs> you know, I just like avoided the Lord's call and the Holy Spirit calling me there. Um, and one night I was walking in the conference center with my friend and he was like, oh, let's go see it. And so we kind of looked at the pamphlets and yada, yada. But the next day at lunch, I just was like, I need to go back to that booth. Um, I want to go see what that's about. And so I went over and um, a missionary approached me and it was actually the Culture Project. And this missionary approached me and started sharing the mission of the Culture Project with me. And I literally burst it into tears. Like I just absolutely lost it because there was something about what they were doing that penetrated my heart and everything that I had been going through between the breakup, between struggling with um, pornography and everything. And she just, she just penetrated my heart. I, my, one of my friends was standing with me and was like, Emily, this sounds just like you. This sounds like the thing, you know? And um, yeah, the missionary pulled me aside and as I was crying (laughs) and like prayed with me. And um, I called my parents later that, that day and told them I knew I want what I wanted to do after college and they were kind of like, okay, you're, you've only finished one semester of college. So, you know, we'll see what happens. But um, from that moment on, the culture project was just kind of in the back of my mind and the work that they were doing. And so I think that the inspiration of, of the work that they were doing and um, the, the call that each missionary has to share their story and to be open with others um, broke open something in my heart. And so um that night we were in adoration um, at the conference and I just knew that I needed to, I really needed help and I needed somebody else to step in and help me. I couldn't just do it on my own. Um, I couldn't just like, in a sense, I couldn't really just pray away this struggle. It was something that needed more vulnerability. And so that night I pulled aside my two friends who came to the conference with me and I shared with them for the first time, everything that I had been dealing with um, and had been holding in And from that moment on, it was the Lord breaking open my heart. Um, And that's kind of what I encourage people going forward. And again, we can keep getting into this, but um, sometimes vulnerability is the biggest opening to healing, Um, being able to open up to somebody else and yeah, help have them help you heal um, is really powerful because especially with this kind of struggle and with any struggle that causes a lot of shame, it's really easy to come in on ourselves and like fall in on ourselves and just stay there and stay put. Um, But truly the Lord wants us to invite other people in so that we can open up and see what it means to love and to be loved. And so that was the first step for me. Um, And it all goes back to me doing the culture project, which is awesome because I did end up becoming a missionary with them. But that was definitely the first step for me in that regard was, um, opening up to a few trusted friends and having them as accountability partners for the next few years um, was really amazing. And, and in turn, they opened up to me about other things as well that they were struggling with and um, started to build some really beautiful friendships. Um, Yeah. I don't know if you have any other questions because it keeps going from there, but (laughs) um, that was definitely a a turning point for sure. Yeah. I, (laughs) and it's so true. It's like everything that you just said, like when we keep it in, Mm-hmm. That the evil one loves that because it's like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, it's in the dark and you're not going to tell anyone because you're ashamed. Right. Like even just thinking through, you know, from the outside how we do that and mm-hmm. how clear it is. Like when I, when you say it or when you hear someone say it, it's so clear mm-hmm. like, oh, of course God would want us to share these things so that we can heal. Like and there's so much there's so much scripture too. like bring it into the light. And Absolutely. it will be healed, you know, and yeah. like th- bring things out of the darkness. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I love what you – and just like even the graces that were being poured out over you that like at mm-hmm. that conference, seeing the Culture Project, being in adoration, mm-hmm. having your friends there, it's like – it was like all just building up and then it just poured out and yeah. then the healing could begin. Mm-hmm. And I, Absolutely. yeah, I, I totally agree. And in my own story too, I, I can see how when there are things that I'm ashamed of or like afraid to say, mm-hmm. they actually become a lot louder in your head mm-hmm. and a lot mm-hmm. worse than if you just share them with someone that you trust. Um, and obviously in confession, which is the most powerful way to do that. Like 
to um, even just the sacrament, like the beauty of it, that we go and we say these things out loud because there's power Mm -hmm. when we speak it because we are basically declaring God's power over this thing. Mm -hmm. And when when we're too afraid to even say it, we're kind of allowing the evil one to control us in that way. Versus just like being free, like when when if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's freedom when we're able to share these things and get them off of our of our chest or get them out of the darkness um, and into the light. Um, yeah, that is so beautiful. And so, did this happen before or after the first time you can remember praying in adoration? Is- before, I want to hear believe that it or too. not. It's still before, believe it or wow. not. Wow. <laughs> okay. 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 So keep going. Yeah. So what yeah. happened next? But I like how you kind of presented that as well as like it was the breaking open so that the healing could begin. And that was when the Lord started to, to or my relationship just like really became real with him in the healing. And so, um, yeah, we, um, I shared with them and they were able to kind of support me in that obviously and um, continue on. And so, as freshman year continued on, I was still really struggling with this breakup and um, just in a dark place with it all. You know, I was the type of person that thought I had planned my entire life and this was going to be it, you know, and, and whatnot. And um, that wasn't what the Lord had planned. Thanks be to God for both of us. And, um, you know, it was he had so much more in store for both of us. And so as the year continued, I um, kept trying to chase. So um the high school boyfriend and I both went to the same school. And, um, so he was, he was around a lot, which is another part of why it was really hard. And it's a small school. So, um, we started being friends with a lot of the same people and seeing each other a lot. And so, um, there was one night in particular where I was just kind of, I found myself chasing, um, him and his friends to parties and trying to get attention and trying to do all these different things and finding my identity and in getting that attention. And, um, there was one night in particular where I just kind of took it a little too far at a, at a party. And, um, I was just kind of ashamed the next morning of, of who I had become, you know, that I had just like become a person that was just chasing after, um, popularity or a guy or anything like that. And I just didn't know who I was anymore because I wasn't the type of person that liked going to parties and I didn't like doing those things, but I was just trying to do it to get attention and to, um, recreate what I thought needed to happen um, and not just accept what the Lord was bringing into my life. And so there's one day where I, I was just really ashamed and I was really sad um, from the weekend. And my mom randomly called me and said she was going to a funeral about two hours away from where my school was. And she just asked if I could come because she didn't really know anybody and she was going to be alone and she wanted some support at the funeral. And so um, on a whim, I'm not the type of person that just drops everything and goes, but I was in such a dark place that I needed to get out and I just needed to switch things up. And so on a whim, I drove up to, to see her and, um, we had a great day and went to the funeral. But later that day, we went to visit some of our family friends who were living out in uh, Omaha where I was at the time. And we're sitting around and they just started chatting with us and telling us about, um, the, the diary of St. Faustina and the divine mercy, um, you know, devotion and everything like that. And they started just sharing that with us. And my mom had been getting into it a little bit as well. And they just were opening my mind and my heart in so many beautiful ways to hear what St. Faustina shared. And it just kind of opened something up again. And so they were sharing at the time there was the, um, I can't remember the name of it now, the, oh, 33 Days to Merciful Love, which was the consecration with the Divine Mercy and um, St. Therese and they were chatting about that. And I just was like, huh, I was really struck by it. So I left directly from their house to drive back to Kansas. And the best way I describe it is when I was driving away from Kansas, I was blasting music. I was trying to like get my mind off of everything that had been going on. I was trying to forget it all and numb it all. But on the way back, I was in complete silence and um, maybe listening to some prayers and worship. But that drive back to Kansas is when I say it was my first real moment of encounter with the Lord of, of really speaking to him. And, um, he very, very clearly said to me that I, I want you to stop drinking and I want you to stop going to parties, um, and learn more about my mercy. And there were like three billboards as I drove on the highway that were divine mercy images as I was driving. And I just couldn't believe it, you know, and just the Lord speaking in such tangible, beautiful ways. 
And so one of my prayers was I was driving back was, okay, but I can't do it alone. Like I, my friends had all started getting into the party scene a little bit here and there. And, um, you know, I wasn't really interested in that. And, um, yeah, he, he was like, I, I've, I've got you. It, it'll be okay. And so I get back to campus and I'm, um, the next day sharing with one of my friends, one of the friends who was with me at the original conference. And I was sharing with her some of my experiences and, I didn't really say anything about what the Lord had challenged me with at that point. Um, and out of nowhere, she just says, yeah, this weekend, you know, I was really thinking and praying about it. And I think I want to give up like drinking and partying and all these things. And I really want to do something different. And I was just like, what? <laughs> you know, that's exactly what the Lord just asked me to do, you know, in, uh, in this moment. And I asked for help and I asked for support and, um, we then decided to do the consecration together as we closed out this, the school year and went into the summer. And it was a really, really beautiful time of entering into the Lord's mercy. And uh, again, nothing was, not, everything didn't just go perfect and I didn't just stop struggling with what I was struggling with, but I felt this deep, deep sense of peace um, that started. Um, and then that following summer, the Lord actually called me to go to World Youth Day, which was in Poland that summer, where Divine Mercy Image came from and St. Faustina and John Paul II were from. And I got to go to all of those sites that exact summer after all of that. And the Lord just really broke that open. Um, followed by about a few weeks later, I started my semester abroad that I did um, through Benedictine. And we had a semester in Florence, Italy. And it was this beautiful timing where the Lord pulled me away from everything. He pulled me away from um, you know, the past relationship pulled me away from some friends, um, that, you know, friendships that were going on at the time that were great, but I just needed to be like on an Island almost. And again, I was only with that one friend who had been doing the consecration with me and that was with me. And, um, it was just a really healing semester and the Lord just, um, almost out of that solitude showed me that I had to ha utterly rely on him and to utterly be his and, um, yeah, we just traveled around and saw all these holy sites and had incredible experiences and um, came back from that semester to um, all of our friends deciding to study abroad the next semester. So then we were back at school, but also in that solitude um, and met some new friends that semester that were just really on fire and decided to kind of run together. And so I had a really amazing crew my sophomore year, my second semester of my sophomore year, where we kind of gave up everything together. Like the guys were doing Exodus 90. We did like um, a, a woman's version of it. And we just like lived this crazy radical life. Um, but I think that's what the Lord, or that's what I needed personally. It was I needed just like to be radical for a year and to to really um, swing in a totally different direction than the, the path I was on at that time. And yeah, it was just really beautiful. And through that healing of that semester, um, started sharing my story more with um, some girls I was leading a Bible study for and then some more of my friends. Um, I eventually started sharing. I was able to share with my mom and my sister after that. And it was just like this breaking open of that of my heart and healing those wounds through every single conversation, um, realizing that these people didn't look at me differently and didn't look at me in a more negative light. But my sister even told me she was like proud of me for sharing this, you know, and that she looked at me in a different way in a, in a better way, in a sense, because I was able to be open and vulnerable with her. And so, yeah, that really just broke up in, um, those two years of healing of, of sophomore and junior year, like really going all in with the Lord and finding that deep intimacy with him. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That was long winded. I'm sorry, oh, but I was my just gosh. <laughs> no, that was amazing. I love all of the things that you shared, just the ways that the Lord was working through mm -hmm. people, through the billboards. Like I know that I love, I love those moments when yeah. it's like how this was literally made for you. Like this was meant to yeah. happen. This whole thing. Like he knew that you would say yes to your mom's phone call mm -hmm. because he knew that you would. And then it was just so beautiful how he laid it all out. And then for you to come back for your friend to mm -hmm. say the same thing that was already on your heart. Like you were both connected obviously to the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and 
it's ah, I just love those confirmations too because you mm-hmm. know beyond a doubt, like okay, this is what God wants me to do. Like, yeah. And then you guys both, I love how you explained like with the whole abroad thing and everything that mm-hmm. God was really. It was it was a time of like purification. I feel like absolutely. in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. yeah. And absolutely, I can totally relate to that. Um, especially in yeah the first like years that you come to know all this and even just like in looking at your whole story, this was like years, you know, years years of life that you, that you were living. But yet when you look back, you can see that thread of what the Lord was doing in your Mm -hmm. heart and in your life and the, the slow movement of how he works with us in these things Mm -hmm. to bring about healing, not only for you, but then also your friend. Like even just as you're sharing the story, I'm thinking about how it's so beautiful that like he also was using you for her. Like you were Mm -hmm. there for her and her journey Mm -hmm. at the same time that she was able to be there for you and yours. And just how the Lord works, it just like blows my mind. It's so Absolutely. beautiful. <laughs> that's something, and that's something I encourage people to do a lot is like make a map of the ups and downs of their life. And once you start looking back and connecting the dots of how the Lord is working through the people and the experiences, it's just so overwhelming to see the um, the journey that He takes you on. Um, because yeah. yeah, it's all meant to be. It's all connected. You know. The fact that I fell in love with divine mercy and then was sent to Poland and then was, and when we were studying abroad, it was the year of mercy too. So they had like all of the special, um, they had all the special doors at all the major basilicas in the, in the world for the year of mercy. And that was when we were abroad and we got to see all these different churches and, um, yeah, the Lord just worked like crazy, you know, and it all came together and the people that were supposed to be together, um, yeah. So yeah, those purification years. And then, um, and then he really set me forth from that part on, you know, um, in the healing and the purification and everything. So. Yeah. And then eventually into missionary to be, to be a missionary. So how did that come about? I mean, it was still in the back of your mind, I imagine. Yeah. So it was still in the back of my mind. Um, they talked to me about it like they would always reach out every year just to check in, you know, whoever they have on their recruitment list, they just check in every year to see how you're doing, if you're still interested. And so um, the culture project was still in the back of my mind. Um, So before the summer before my senior year of college, I had a really incredible opportunity to work on Capitol Hill and to work in the U S house of representatives. Um, I mentioned I minored in political science and it's always been like a guilty pleasure of mine. I just love politics and learning about that. And, um, grew up doing some volunteering here and there. Um, but I had this awesome opportunity to move out to DC for the summer and work, um, you know, on Capitol Hill and all the glitz and the glam of Washington DC life. And, um, it was a really incredible summer. And, but by the end of it, I was like, maybe I'm supposed to come right back out here after college, you know, maybe I'm supposed to be called back to this. And, I was really ready to be an evangelist in the political arena. And I was like, I'm going to be a missionary in the, in the political arena. And I took that to prayer one night and the Lord just very much um, said to me, um, I want your undivided attention for a year and I will continue to bless your life after that basically is, is the, what I heard in prayers. I want your undivided attention. And so to me in my discernment, what that meant was, yes, we're called to be missionaries in all aspects of society and in all aspects of life and we need doctors and politicians and business people who are missionaries, but the Lord asked for my undivided attention and my undivided desire to be a missionary and to give of my full life to him that summer. And so, um, or that next year. And so I knew I should be a missionary. So that was kind of the fall of my senior year of college. Um, I had a really beautiful, I mean, the Lord, um, freed me from my struggle, um, that same year. And, um, it was really tied up with, um, I, I didn't really mention this, but throughout my life, my dad and I have had a, a little bit of a hard relationship, just having very similar personalities and butting heads a lot. And um, it was one component of, of just healing that my heart needed. And we had a, a, a beautiful encounter that Christmas break, um, a, a moment of healing. And I went to the SEEK conference again. I'm always at these conferences, I feel like, is where it happened. And I was at the SEEK conference and it was about to be my my interview for the Culture Project. They did their interviews while we were at the conferences. And um, I was just, 
I was in adoration and I was still just angry at the Lord that this was a, a struggle that I was still dealing with in my life. And I just was like crying out to him in adoration. And he said, um, like, why? I was crying. Why is this something that I had to struggle with? Why is this my story? And all I heard back was to share it, to go forth and to share it, like share the story. And um, from that moment on, praise the Lord, I, I haven't struggled again with pornography. And it was just like this moment of like, okay, now you're being sent. And because of that moment being so real and so tangible, I knew that when I did become a missionary, I wanted to be really open with the girls I would speak with and um, kind of made that vow to myself that I wouldn't hold back in sharing. And um, yeah, so finished out senior year, had a great year last year at Benedictine and headed off that June to our culture project training, um, had a few days at training, and then we do a summer of support raising our salaries and then um, had a six weeks of training in the fall where we learned the talks and practice the talks that we would give to the kids. And um, like I said, I just decided I was going to share it all with, with the girls that I spoke with. And so for the rest of that year, I, I was just amazed, um, utterly amazed. I think we might have lost her again, or I don't know if we lost me. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was just utterly amazed by the girls that would come up to me and would share similar aspects of their story and would um, have a lot of questions or, or need guidance and in, in different things. And, um, oh, there you, oh, there you are. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm back again. Welcome um, back. I was, just, <laughs> well, I was just continuing on. Of, what did you hear last? <laughs> yeah. That you were, that you were ready to share it all. And yeah, then you explained like, yeah, what the training process was like and yeah. how you were going to, you were vulnerable with the girls that you met and spoke to. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, what I was, kind of continuing on with that was um it was just really mind-boggling how many women shared similar stories with me when I would get up and I would share about this and um I think it was like the final healing that I needed um was to see um that struggle and that sin becoming beautiful in the lives of others and like being a moment of them starting to be released from the similar struggle, if that makes sense. And so that was kind of the culmination of that particular struggle, because again, praise the Lord, in my case, it hasn't come back in that regard. And um, yeah, I've been just, I, I really do think it was just a beautiful year of, of trying to walk with these girls that I would meet. And I couldn't really walk with them because it was, we would come in and give talks and then we would kind of just like leave them to their youth ministers. But I always saw it as as that breaking open process that I had of that moment where I just broke open and the amount of girls that came up to me after my talks and said that I was the first person that they had ever opened up to. Um, It was just, it was incredible. And um, so grateful that the Lord was able to move in some of their hearts in a similar way. And that's what I kind of still try to do. I'm actually giving a a talk. I haven't given a chastity talk in a really long time, but I'm giving one on Friday to a local high school here. (laughs) And I'm like, oh my gosh. But this is reinvigorating in me that desire to just um, be open and be vulnerable and um, provide the space for other women to heal. And so um, that's where I'm at now in my own personal ministry. I'm still discerning what that looks like and what the Lord is calling me to in that. Um, I've recently helped an organization that does kind of some healing um, prayer journals and different things. We just finished writing a journal for girls who are struggling with pornography. Um, And it's going to be like a small group thing, um, which I can share more information about that. And so, yeah, right now I'm just taking whatever door comes open and seeing where the Lord leads me in that. But um, it was a beautiful experience. And then for it to be so healed in that time, completely prepared me for my vocation and for Nathan to come then come into my life and be ready for marriage and not be taking all of this into marriage and taking that struggle into it, but to really be ready to love in a pure and authentic full way. Um, And yeah, it was just, again, the timing was perfect and the Lord knew that he would come into my life and that I needed to be fully ready. Um, And he prepared me fully for that. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love how in your story it's like when you surrendered it to him, like it was just this journey of surrendering deeper and deeper and the Lord 
he's got it all figured out. You know, Mm -hmm. like he already knows what we need. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry that, oh, but you might forget this detail or that detail. It's like, no, like he knows what we need and he's going to provide it even better than the way that we might think it has to happen. But it's so hard to let go when when we can't see, you know, how this is going to work out. And we think only this way that I can think of is the only way it could work out, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, we just have to let loosen our grip and let it go, give it to God. And then you see the ways that he's able to work just like wonders through your yes and your surrender. And I love how all the details just like feed into one another to then have you go out and help other women. And right, I love how you shared that even in doing that, it was like this other layer of healing for you to be mm-hmm. able to see it in others, like to see mm-hmm. what God's doing through your your witness and your testimony, but also in their lives and mm-hmm. um, their own healing journeys. Um, so gosh, that is so beautiful and so amazing that it all worked out, right, leading into your vocation. Mm-hmm. God is so good. He's – Oh, it's just amazing when, <laughs> when, when you really look at it like that and you see all the things that he was able to weave into that. Mm-hmm. It's so beautiful. Mm. Well, I would love to hear more about that journal project. Is that something that people can find yet or is it? Um, I don't know if it's available yet. Um, there's an organization called um, Behold Visio Divina. Um, and if anybody follows me on Instagram, they can definitely hear more more about it as it comes out more. Um, but I'm on their writing team now and, um, we've just been working on that a little bit. Um, I hope it's okay that I talk about it because, (laughs) but I was just excited, you know, like I'm excited that it's kind of like this new step in it. Um, I think they were, they were getting a T or they had a group that was testing it out over Lent, um, the, or the Easter season. Um, so they're kind of doing that now, but it hasn't been published yet or anything. So, um, stay tuned for more information on that. <laughs> awesome. Yes, I have yeah. heard of them actually. So okay. maybe, yeah, give them a follow on Instagram or yeah. wherever. Um, and I'm sure more information will be coming soon because that sounds so beautiful. I love that idea yeah. in a journal format. I think that's yeah. so, so powerful. It's healing um, through images too. It's sacred images. So you kind of do like Lexio Divina, Divina, you look at images and do Visio Divina in that regard. So um, doing a little bit of healing through that. So beautiful. Yeah, That's an amazing. Project. I yeah. love that. All right. Well, I want to open it up for any questions yeah. that um, any of our live viewers might have. So if you're watching live, ask your questions or post your comments, reactions, anything at all for Emily in the chat, and we will open it up to take a couple of your questions. Um, but as we're collecting those, I wanted to ask the last question that we love to ask guests that come on the show, which is, can you share with us one scripture verse that is either Mm -hmm. speaking to you recently or that has played a foundational role in your journey and Mm why? Mm -hmm. Um, it would definitely be my favorite scripture verse, um, which is John 10, 10. Um, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, um, is my favorite translation of that verse. Um, and it's just something that has always struck me because it, you know, when I was feeling really deep in my struggle or feeling deep in suffering, um, just that promise of the abundance of life that, that God has for us, um, was really healing. And, uh, so that's something that has always kind of jumped out to me. I love that word abundantly. I love abundance and just the overflowing of life that the Lord has in store for us. Um, but then kind of it, it continues on. So that's, that's a phrase that's often quoted from John Paul II's trip to Denver when he came to Denver in 1993 for World Youth Day. And so that's a really popular quote um, about that. And um, that's another whole part of my story is kind of my journey with John Paul II and his fatherhood over my life. And um, I love that he came to Denver and that he like loved my city and he loved this place. And so it's been really cool because that's actually – probably one of the biggest um, quotes that's used around the archdiocese now. So it's cool that I work at the archdiocese of Denver and we talk about John 10, 10 all the time. I literally walked into my first day of work and it's painted on the wall um, when you walk in at the front office. So it's just really cool how the Lord again, carries those similar themes throughout my life of, of 
kind of follow me in that. Oh my gosh, I see my husband is the only one that's asked a question so far. I don't know if you saw that. Oh, thank you, Nathan. He's upstairs Thanks listening to us. I, I love it. Get get the conversation going. But um, yeah, that's my favorite quote, and it's really fun that it's on my thing. So, um, can I just tell you? <laughs> look at my phone background. Is it really? It's John ten ten. No way. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so yeah, fun. so the Holy Spirit is a move-in. But um, yeah, I love that scripture verse. And so good. just like recently too, I feel like it's really been speaking to me that yeah. this joy, like God wants us to enjoy life. Like the things that make us come alive, mm-hmm. the good, true, beautiful things, like we should lean into those and live a life full of joy. Right. Because that's what he wills for us. You know, he came Absolutely. so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Like, mm-hmm. so I love that reminder too. Um, it's a great phone background, I will say, because <laughs> it's such a good reminder throughout your day to like soak in the things that make you joyful mm-hmm. and Amen. enjoy them, you know, like rest in them that we have permission to do that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if anyone else can relate, but I feel like sometimes – in our culture and in our world, it's like this, like, it's just rush, 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 stress, stress, stress. Mm-hmm. And then like, if you're actually joyful, people think like, I don't know, you're naive or just like something's wrong with you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's actually just countercultural to just be joyful despite your circumstances. And that's what life with the Lord should be. Um, so – I love that you just mentioned that, especially because it's just been speaking to my heart so much. And and that's I love awesome. how you also shared how scripture follows you. And so yeah. that's why I just love scripture so much because the Lord will use it in your story throughout your life and throughout your journey to continue to lead you closer to him. Mm-hmm. And he can use his word to like create like an inside joke with you or like a little God <laughs> wink. And every time you see yes. it, yeah, it's like you know it's that. for you. You know what yeah. I mean? And that's awesome. Yeah. I, I haven't heard it. that phrase God wink since high school. That was something we said all the time in high school. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. They're so good when you have those little moments and you know it's just like between you and him. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's giving you those little, I don't know, it's like a crumb on your path too. It's like you're in the right place. Like keep going. Yeah. Um, so I love that when you walked in, it was right on the wall. Like it's like, yeah. here I am, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're in the right place. I brought you yes. here. Yeah. It's so awesome. good. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, we – let's see. Let's see what we got in the chat. We have a lot of comments actually we in do the have chat. a lot of comments. I saw it. So let's see. Somebody said, Abby said, you're very brave in sharing your story. So thank you, Abby. Thank you, Thanks Abby. Thanks for watching. I hope that this <laughs> – story moved you in some way I know it moved me it was so powerful um let's see such a beautiful testimony from Natalie (laughs) Natalie. (laughs) uh let's see she also said I have a divine mercy image right in front of me love divine mercy devotion so much that's great that's awesome it is so powerful I just got to go to the divine mercy shrine in Stockbridge um, oh, wow. That's for the awesome. first time. And on Divine Mercy Sunday, cool. it was such a grace and such a gift and That's so awesome. powerful. Oh, my gosh. To see just like, yeah, the confession line and just mm. how amazing it was. Oh, it was That's so definitely good. a bucket list place. Yes. Sure. If you go, let me know because I'm I'm not too far from there. So okay. awesome. we can meet up. <laughs> that would be awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Your husband asked <laughs> – Thank you, Nathan, for the question. He <laughs> asked, Emily, who is your favorite person in the world? Oh, oh trick, question, trick question. <laughs> trick question. <laughs> it's of course you, Nathan. I'm sure you can probably hear me even saying this. He's just upstairs. <laughs> oh, that is so That's sweet great. that he's watching. I love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, unless anybody has any other questions that's watching live, thank you so much for just coming on and sharing your story with us. I pray Mm -hmm. that, yeah, maybe this moves someone or maybe someone's in a similar spot and through hearing this, they might, um, yeah, feel 
the courage or the grace to share mm-hmm. with somebody in their life and begin the healing journey mm-hmm. toward the Lord. Um, mm-hmm. But did you have any other closing thoughts or where can people find you online to follow yeah. you in the future? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think those are great closing thoughts. And that's something that I often try to leave um, other girls with is just, and, and anybody, men and women, um, just the the beauty that comes in doing the Christian life in relationship, right? We're made for relationship and we're made to, to go about it together. And so um, if there's anything that is keeping you inside yourself and that you feel ashamed, the Lord wants to break that open. And um, it's really just pride that keeps us there because we don't want people to know. We don't want or we feel like we can do it ourselves, you know, but, um, a lot of times so much healing can come in breaking down the walls of shame and to opening up with other people and to being with other people, but also always be, um, be weary of it and make sure that you have good friends that are, that will lead you down the right path and that will encourage you in the correct way. Um, really just, um, make sure that you take that into discernment and take that to prayer um, how you should go about that in, in your own life and in your own story. So I'm really encouraging you to do that and to turn to the Lord's mercy, learn more about his mercy and his love, and um, it'll just overflow into your life. And so um, the best place to find me right now is just on Instagram. Um, I, I use my account. I'm trying to get back into the swing of it with wedding planning and getting back into the hang of everything. It was got it got a little crazy there. So i um, trying to use that a little bit more. Um, so it's at emily.marie.crankfield. And then um, also my husband uses Instagram a lot as well. And um, he has a podcast and I'm on his podcast every once in a while. So his podcast is called the Seeking Excellence Podcast. A little shameless plug for him. His little logo is right behind me. Or I guess right there. There it is. <laughs> and um, yeah, I've we've done a few episodes together and we have a lot more planned. So um, if you want to hear any more of we have a whole episode on our story and how we came together and everything. So um, that's all on there, Seeking Excellence. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I'll link that um, in the show notes as well. So if anybody wants to find where they can find Emily, you can follow those links. Thank you so much again for sharing your journey. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing everything the Lord does from here with your Mm -hmm. journey and your story and your vocation. And yeah, many prayers for you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. All right. I'll let you go. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us for another conversion story on to grow good. If this is your first time here, You should know that we come out with a new conversion story every Wednesday night live on YouTube at 7 p.m. And then you can also watch the stories anytime after the streams or listen on your favorite podcasting app. We're on all the podcasting apps. You just search to grow good. Rachel Smith, one or the other, probably to grow good and Rachel Smith. You'll definitely find this show and the full collection of 70 plus conversion stories that we have, um, just beautiful journeys of how the Lord has worked in people's lives to bring them into his church and to bring them into closer relationship with him. The most amazing coincidences, God winks, things that seem just impossible to line up in that way. And it's just so beautiful to, to see how in each story, it's so unique to the path that um, each one of us is on. It's so unique to each one of our hearts. And so that's why I love to listen to conversion stories because no two are ever the same because no two of us are the same. God created each one of us with a different heart and different things that draw us closer to him. Um, So if you're interested, you can check out the full collection of the stories anywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, If you haven't yet already, hit subscribe on our YouTube channel. You can leave a comment, like this video, and I want to invite you too to share it with someone in your life. Maybe there's someone in your life that struggles with chastity or has been exposed to pornography, Um, and maybe this story could be a way to open a door 
in their healing journey or in your own um, or to even open a door in a relationship to to even talk about these things. So if you feel that nudge from the Holy Spirit, I just encourage you to share this episode with a friend, a family member, someone in your life that you feel called to share it with. If you haven't yet already and you're listening on any podcasting app, please leave us a review. A written review on iTunes goes a really long way to helping other souls find these stories and um, find the show. And so if you're a longtime listener or if you're just tuning in for the first time, feel free to go on over to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and leave this show to grow good, a written review. Lastly, you can follow us on Instagram at to grow good. I will see you next week, hopefully for our next conversion story. It'll be live right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. on Wednesday night. All right, friends, I hope you have a great rest of your week and I will see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of To Grow Good. There are a number of ways you can support this mission. Follow us on Instagram at To Grow Good. Join the email list at togrowgood.com for free weekly devotions written by Catholic women, a monthly newsletter with the most impactful content along my journey home to the church, and a notification each time we upload a new episode. Share this episode with a friend, a family member, a loved one, or a coworker. Leave a written review on Apple Podcasts to help refer the show to others who might be seeking. And you can pray. Pray for this show to reach the souls that God wishes for it to reach. If you are praying for To Grow Good, please be sure to reach out and let me know at togrowgoodpodcast at gmail.com. Finally, you can help to cover the financial cost to create and produce this show. For as little as one ice latte a month, you could join our little community here at To Grow Good the branches of the vine in exchange for monthly bonus episodes, gifts from the to grow good shop and more. You can learn more by visiting patreon.com slash to grow good. Thank you so much for being here friend. And I will see you next time.